Hi, my name is Mylon Lefevre, and music is in my blood. I got my first big break when Elvis Presley recorded a song I'd written at 17 years old. That moment changed my life forever. I went from having nothing to having my dreams come true. I toured the world and played with some of the biggest names in music and had more money than I knew what to do with. I finally hit rock bottom when I almost died from a drug overdose, and it became painfully obvious something had to change. Everything did change when I gave my life to Jesus at a second chapter of Acts concert in 1980. God instantly delivered me from drugs and totally turned my life around. I began to use my gift of music for the Lord and started a Christian band, Mylon and Broken Heart. It eventually grew to be one of the biggest Christian rock bands in the world at the time. We won several Grammys and Dove Awards, but most importantly, we led over 200,000 kids to Christ. Now, years later, I'm still living for Jesus, and my wife, Christy, and I travel the globe proclaiming God's goodness. I've been from rock bottom to the mountaintop and I'm going all the way to heaven. So come on and join me on the road to freedom. Welcome, this is On the Road to Freedom, and I'm Christy Lefevre, this is my husband Mylon, and we're so excited today to be in Legendary Sound Studio with Michael Howell. They're some of our closest friends, Michael and Sherry Howell, and we're excited about sharing your testimony today. Yeah, the Bible says that Satan's defeated by the blood of the Lamb, and of course the Lamb of God, Jesus, supplied His blood and the word of our testimony, and I'm going to give you mine today, and in, in fact, it's going to take a few weeks to give you that, but we're really looking forward to it. It's about a whole bunch of really cool stuff that God did for us. Anyway, this is Michael Howell, y'all. Hey. Hey. hey Thank buddy. you guys for letting me be a part of this. Awesome. I have been a Milan fan since the early, early days of my life. I think about maybe I was 12 years old or so when I first heard you, and um, then later on, about 27 years ago, I worked on Faith, Hope, and Love with you yeah. in the studio, wow. and that's when we really met and got to know each other and became Started friends. Started working together. And yeah. Up until that time, I think like most people in the Christian world that know you, I knew you as Mylon of the Christian rock band Mylon and Broken Heart. Mm -hmm. What I didn't know was that there's this whole backstory mm -hmm. that weaves into gospel music as a whole that's really a lot of the, the uh, pioneers of the gospel music movement that we know of came out of your family. And so um, I'm going to just be a guest historian today since I love <laughs> digging into all this and I've heard so many great stories. And let me Sorry. say this, Michael and I also did Church on the Run together. It took That's us right. almost five years. Mm -hmm. We made a lot of records. Five so short years. We had, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and our families, we've just done a whole lot of projects together. And in fact, everybody working on this show, I'll introduce all of them to you eventually. We've been working together for a while, and, and uh, I don't want you to meet the whole crew someday. Go ahead, my brother. Yeah. <laughs> so starting back in the early days, I love in your book when you tell some of your first memories of growing up in a gospel music family. But actually, the music was happening before you were born, I believe. The music was my mom and my dad. Actually, it was my father and my uncle and their sister, Aunt Maud, Aunt Maud. who were the beginning, <laughs> the very first, like 1918, 19, along wow. in there. Their first big break was 1921. They got to play the Grand Ole Opry. Uh, the sponsor was Purina Chow, and they gave them two live chickens and 50 pounds of, of grain. Wow. <laughs> That's what they got paid for doing the gig. Now, was and the grain for them or for their the chickens. animals? On the <laughs> <laughs> so you get the chickens, and we're going to throw in the food yeah. as well. And they had to ride 70 miles in a wagon, a buggy. Wow. But, you know, I was born in 44 and uh, grew up on the road. I mean, that's the, the title of this TV show is On the Road to Freedom. And the Bible says, whom the sun set free is free indeed. We're going to talk to you about freedom. You're going to really, really get to know how free a man can be. This is cool stuff. Anyway, I've been on the road, as you know, 50, this is my 56th year. And uh, in some kind of musical capacity, my first memories were riding in the back of my daddy's old Cadillac. I think it was, a, I think it was about a 1948, 47, right uh -huh. along in there. I'd be peeking out the back window at night after the gig 
Gig would be over about nine or 10. We didn't have much gear, so we'd tear down quick, start driving to the next town. I'd be watching those white lines disappear under the glow of those red tail lights. Oh, wow. Yeah, that well, sounds so romantic. Thousands of miles. <laughs> so what, what clicked for you and you knew this is what I'm going to do? I, I'm going to make music. I think the first time, you know, when your parents are musicians, all their friends are. So there were instruments laying around the house. And uh, when their friends came over, musicians jam. That's what they do. So I grew up thinking that's what everybody's parents do. You know, we yeah. ate at truck stops after the gig. I thought everybody ate at truck that's stops. <laughs> well, yeah, when you're four or five, that's what. But every Thanksgiving, we would go up to my Aunt Maud's farm. Aunt Maud and Uncle Othel had a farm right outside of McMinnville, Tennessee. And they had a big farm. And we would, and by the way, his, Othel's brother, Homer, had the <laughs> na farm next Where door. Where did these names <laughs> come Country from? Country names, right. <laughs> Homer and Inez lived on the farm it. next door to Oval and Maud. They were so cool, man. The finest people you'd ever want to meet. Anyway, uh, we would meet up there at Thanksgiving, and the, all the kinfolks would come from far and wide, and they would all have this big spread, and all the aunts and the grandmas, and, you know, set out this big monster spread, and everybody would go hunting. All the boys would get up and go hunting in the morning. We'd hunt all day. We'd come home just starving, and they'd put out this big spread, and we would eat until you just couldn't walk. Oh, man. And then we'd go out on the front porch, <laughs> and everybody would just sit there and breathe and, and, and pick their teeth with toothpicks and that kind of stuff, you know. And I remember maybe 15, 20 minutes, somebody would get out a harmonica or some acts, you know, but... <laughs> and as soon as the music started, people would start leaving the porch, or they'd reach under a swing and get out a guitar or a banjo or a mandolin. Or, or moonshine. A, no, no not, not, at the, not at this gathering. Okay. They, they might have had some, but we didn't see it. I'm just flashing they back to the Beverly Hillbillies. When my mama that. was there. Yeah. But, uh, you know, they'd start, they'd start, and it was bluegrass, of course, yeah. and what they called Southern Gospel, but it was really a Nobody mixture Nobody ever called of country. it that before, really, yeah. That yeah. was, this was a new genre that was oh, beginning was, at that time. It was. It was mountain music, and it was a mixture of um, southern, what they call spiritual music, mm -hmm. which was black-influenced. And it was just uh, a conglomeration of all of that, and they would just take turns. Somebody would start a song. And usually the, the, the ones in my family who were the best musicians, they would wait a while. They would let the ones who wanted to be musicians Just warm go up. ahead and start, yeah. <laughs> and they didn't get to blow much, and they, you know, they let them jam, and in a little while, the the ones who really were good at it would get their axes out, and they were all acoustic. I mean, my uncle Alf had a uh, an accordion, and he had a, a fiddle. You you know the difference in a a fiddle and a violin. There is, there is no difference. It's according to who's playing it. But when my <laughs> uncle played it, he could saw that puppy in two, and it was a fiddle. Okay, right? yeah. And I would just sit there on that porch, and I would watch them blow, and I would watch them when it started falling in the pocket. And you could feel when it locked in, when the better musicians started. And even though it wasn't always my style of music, they did it so well. I remember coming off that porch thinking, man, I got to do this. I have to be a part of that somehow, someday. That I had to make music. your gift. You knew yeah. that was what you were supposed to do. Yeah. And those those stories paint a picture of humble people in the backwoods, yeah. uh, country people. But it Sweet. wasn't long before I think they had the the first syndicated Christian TV show. Mom and Dad had the first one on the earth. They had at one point it was on 126. TV stations. Wow. And, and this, what year was this? You know, I was probably 12, 10, 12, maybe 13, 14. I know I got in a lot of fights. We had a, we had a sponsor called Martha White Flower, and the product had this stuff in it called Hot Rise. You know, it was like the meal, the corn meal, had, or that you made cornbread and biscuits out of. Flower, it had this stuff in it called Hot Rise. I sung and played bass on the intro, on the theme song. Wow. And so at school, I, everybody called me Hot Rise, and I was just, you know, 
freshman, sophomore in high school, so that one's embarrassing to me. <laughs> I got in trouble over that one. I think that we have some footage of the Lefevers performing cool. way back then. So Whoa. let's get some hot rice biscuits on, and gravy son. while everybody else watches this video of the Lefevers. Y'all are going to enjoy this. On the wings of a snow Now that right there is the real deal. Does that bring back some memories for you? Oh, so. <laughs> We've talked a lot in the in the first part of the show about the musical side of things. Yeah. But it wasn't just music. It was there's a spiritual connection with of all course. this. It wasn't just picking and grinning. There was something on the inside that was connecting these people to God. And you grew up in in church. Your granddad was the preacher. You were on the front row. Yes, How, sir. What part did that play in your life and the path that you'd take? Well, sometimes it was a little confusing for me, and that's the reason I wanted to do this segment today. We've been talking about me a lot, but as a kid, I was a little confused. I knew there was a God. I never doubted that. My granddaddy, like you said, was the preacher. Mom and dad sung about Jesus. I believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. I did not doubt that. We went to church all the time. And, uh, and I believed what they told me. But as I grew older, I started to have some questions. And when you ask questions and the people around you don't know the answers, you... Uh, <laughs> You're the, rebellious. The, well, the <laughs> preaching wasn't teaching. It was what they call fire and brimstone preaching in those days. Let's God die. You know, some of that <laughs> stuff. And, and there was a whole lot of preaching against things which is, you know, now that I understand the Bible, that's not what we're called to do. We're not called to find fault and point out problems. Right. We're called to point at Jesus, who is the solution to every problem. Yeah. So I had this problem trying to find Jesus in the midst of all the religion. There was right. a lot of legalism in those days, and the people who have legalism don't know they have it. People who are immature Christians, they judge others, they find fault with others. Religion basically is, the Bible says in the last days there'll be some who have a form of godliness that denies the power thereof, or the power of God. If you have a relationship with Jesus instead of religion, that relationship with Jesus Christ will change you from the inside. It will cause you to love people that are hard to love. It will cause you to be more peaceful. 
It'll give you more joy. Your patience will increase. The, the Bible says in Galatians 5 and 22 that when we submit to the Lord or to the Holy Spirit, this the Spirit of God that comes into you when you accept Jesus, when we submit to Him, then He produces this kind of fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And if you're in a place where there's not much of that fruit, then what you get is just a bunch of rules. You know, the women couldn't wear makeup, and they, you couldn't go to movies, you couldn't play Rook, <laughs> or Uno because it was cards. You couldn't play Monopoly because they had dice. Wow. You couldn't go, they had so many rules. You could go roller skate, and for some reason they allowed us to roller skate. <laughs> but as long as it was like Bean Crosby or Frank Sinatra was saying, right. but if Little Richard came on, we had to go sit down and say, the devil's wow. music. It wasn't the devil's music, it was just music. And we were trying to take good music, since God's the creator, and make it back focused on Jesus and on the things that man really needs, but they just weren't having any of it. Yeah. And a lot of our most creative young people, and I was one of them, my parents traveled all the time, and so they sent me to schools um, where you could board, where you, you know, they had dormitories where you could stay. And one of those was in Greenville, South Carolina, uh, a well-known university, and they kicked me out for singing with my parents. My parents came to Greenville to do a concert, and the dean of men said I couldn't go to the concert. My dad uh, said I was going anyway, so he said, the dean said, well, you can go, but you can't sing. And my dad, of course, had me sing, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. This is just an innocent little song, but that university gave me 100 demerits and kicked me out. Wow. Which was... When you come home and you've been kicked out of school, there's shame involved. I was a sophomore in high school. And, and I didn't get drunk, I didn't steal anything, I didn't lie to anybody. My sin was, I sung Must Jesus Bear the Cross Alone with my mother and father. And they called that Jesus Jazz. And it was as far, I mean, it was closer to Lawrence Welk than <laughs> Jazz, you know? Well, one of the straightest. And I, I must admit, I, I look back on my life I got so hurt over that, and I got so angry, and I was so ashamed, and I had, I had disappointed my parents. I was making good grades. I was trying to make everybody proud of me. I took voice at that university. Wow. I took voice, and when I sat down at the piano to do my, um, what do you call it, they make you do when you first join the Audition. An audition. Yeah. I sat down to audition for the voice uh, choir, and they dismissed me because of the style of music that I was playing and singing and told me I couldn't sing. And I remember thinking, we'll see. <laughs> that hurts when it's your dream. Well, when you're 13, yeah. 14. Once Elvis cut one of my songs, everybody was asking, you got any more songs? Man, I was turning them out five a day, you know? Yeah. And, and, and hundreds of people were recording my songs and doors were opening and opportunities were coming. And the only choice I had was stay here where they persecute me and tell me when and any of this, you're not making that music around here. Yeah. Or come out here where we'll pay you a whole lot of money and treat you like a hero and uh, accept you, we won't judge you. I love that scripture that you shared at the top, we've overcome by the blood of the lamb yes. and the word of our testimony. And one of the things I love about your testimony and something that's really close to your heart is that because things happened to you in the early years, you weren't driven away from God by God. It was religion that really pushed sure. you away. And sure. you were looking for that relational mm -hmm. aspect of God. Yes. And a lot of people say they don't believe in God and they don't like church and they don't, they won't, don't want anything to do with Jesus. But I think what they really mean is, I don't want anything to do with religion because Anybody that experiences God, the real God, the real yeah. Jesus, will fall they'll be hooked. Yeah. What would you, because um, I'm sure a lot of people watching are people that have been hurt in some way, and we know people are people, and we're human, and we do things, and we don't mean to hurt people, that, but we do. Uh, what would you say to somebody that's watching today that's been hurt or disillusioned by the church? Well, forgiveness is, is what God has done for us. I mean, when we accept Jesus, 
He forgives us of all of our sins. He heals all our diseases. He forgives all our sins. I mean, it's amazing what God does for us. And, but he does require us to do that for everybody else. And only mature Christians do that. We get rid of all of our excuses. And here's the way you do that. When somebody really hurts you and, and you know you're not supposed to get offended, but you know in your heart every time their name comes up, you get frustrated and you, you think about all the stuff they did that hurt you. And, and, and it just makes you angry if you talk about it, if you think about it. But the way to get that out of your heart, the Bible says, is bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. And man, when you really forgive people, now you're starting to be like him. And that's the whole goal of Christianity. It's not just to go to church on Sunday and, and stop drinking and, you know, shooting people and robbing banks and whatever you think is bad. What Christianity is about is, Mylon, stop being like Mylon and get rid of all your excuses, son, and grow up in love and go ahead and start thinking, study the Word, think about what God said every day until you start to get the mind of Christ and the wisdom of God. When you start thinking like Him, you'll start talking like Him, you'll start acting like Him. Now Christ in you, the hope of glory, can actually use you, use your lips, use your heart, use your money, use your marriage, use your family to accomplish the perfect plan and will and purpose of God in the earth for your life. And man, when you become a part of that, we're here today for one reason, not really to talk about my life, but to talk about the mistakes I made so that you can see that God was patient with me. People weren't, but God was. God was so patient, so merciful, so kind. And, and I want to be one of those people that's like him, don't you? Praise God, I know you do. Can I pray with you today before we go? Father, I just lift up my precious brothers and sisters to you. I ask you to pour out your spirit upon them and grant them the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the intimate knowledge of God. And Lord, we'll be very careful, sir, to give you all the glory and all the honor for what you have done in our lives and what you're going to do starting today. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. God bless you. We'll get to see you soon again, I hope. My life is like a storybook. It's an amazing, true story about a country boy whose dreams all came true. My parents were gospel singers when I was 17 years old. I had written a song that Elvis Presley had recorded, and he was the biggest star in the world at the time. Doors were open, TV and stadiums and coliseums. And for me, it was a dream world. I didn't know how to handle it. I'd never had any money before. I'd never had a lot of attention before. After meeting Elvis, I met the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and Clapton and Dylan, and I mean, I was getting high with all these guys. And I got strung out, man. What I thought was a party ended up being like a pit of oppression and discouragement and depression. In 1980, the second chapter of Acts concert, I got born again and gave not just my problems, but my life to the Lord. You know, I had to quit rock and roll to get away from the drugs and the groupies and and to live for Jesus. So my pastor gave me a job as a janitor at my church. We started a little band called Broken Heart. And we were just playing in high schools around Atlanta and you know, just leading kids to Jesus anywhere we could. That group grew until uh, we headlined every Christian festival that we wanted to play in the world for years there. And you know, won Grammys and Dove Awards and, and sold millions of records. But the most important thing was we led a couple hundred thousand kids to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So I've written a book basically about my life. I believe the Lord told me to, that I needed to share what He has done for me with prisoners and with soldiers. I want to give this book to those guys that are behind bars, 
the guys who were angry and rebellious like I was, who now are in a hopeless place and without Christ. And so uh, this book is a simple book. It's about an hour and a half read. It's mostly pictures. There is a scripture, my favorite in fact, that says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And blessed is the man who trusts in Him. A purpose for writing this book is to uh, help those people who don't go to church, who, who don't really watch Christian TV, but who need to know the truth that can set a man free. If you've been following my ministry for very long, then you already know Michael Howell and his wife Sherry. They've been partners with us in ministry for so many years. We've made records together, probably 20, 25 years. Yeah. Uh, Rob, our, our sound guy here, uh, Matthew and Mary, there, there's so many guys that you would know. But I asked Michael to step in here for a second because not only do we work together making music or making we made a five-year devotional um, church on the run together. We've done all kind of stuff all over the world together. But I asked Michael to come in and join me because I partner with his ministry because they do things that I can't do. And he partners with my ministry. He sows his finances in our ministry and helps us to do what we're anointed to do and vice versa. You want to share something, Michael, sure. about well, how it works? For me, it's... It's just the reality that we need each other in the body of Christ. No one ministry or one minister or one person is anointed to do it all. We all have our place and our gifting and our part to do in the kingdom. And so when I sow into you, there's an anointing that's on your life that I partake of. And when you yeah. sow into me, vice versa. Exactly. Um, and we also reap the financial benefit. And so, exactly. Um, in short, we need each other. We and, need each uh, other. And we need you. We need your help just like you need ours. If you want to help us to take a whole bunch of people to heaven when we go, then all you got to do is go to mylon.org, M-Y-L-O-N.org. Click on Team Mylon, fill that out, become our partner. And we will believe God with you for supernatural increase in your life. God said it, we believe it, and we expect it. And we'll be praying for you, you'll be praying for us, and you and me will take a whole bunch of people to heaven with us when we go. And God will bless you for it.